Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Last three three weeks, I've been about about 7,000 miles all over the country: Montana, Wisconsin, started in Texas, all the way to Washington State, down through Phoenix, and um, on my way to Tucson, then back home to Houston. My wife actually bought my van for me for my birthday uh, four and a half years ago, and I've been 170,000 miles in it since then. Yeah, people are really shocked about the mileage on it. It's pretty funny, um, but you know, I mean, uh, one of the things is. What I find funny is a lot of people go, I can't believe you would drive a 1964 van cross country. And I'm like, well, in 1964, they drove it across country. The only thing that's different is the speed limit's not 55 anymore and the roads are actually better. So there's no reason not to drive it. Pretty much done this for the last four and a half years, uh, three or four times a year. I usually average about 60,000 miles a year in the van. A lot of photographers that do what I do are more interested in like, hey, let's go to these big fancy shops and rub elbows with the big builders. I like to get out and go all over the country and find guys that normally don't get the press uh, for magazines and stuff the other guys get and try and go out and find really badass hot rods and really cool hot rods in the middle of nowhere. All the great builders and owners, you know, this is all about them. They do, they make me look good. Without them, I'm just, we always make the joke that I'm just shooting happy little trees and old buildings and stuff like that, you know, and it's, you know, without great owners and builders, you know, I, I wouldn't have a job. And, you know, a lot of people forget that, you know, it's, without people building cool stuff, you know, we're, we just don't have a job. So thanks to everybody who's helped us out. Well, the reason why I do this is I've always been a car guy. I mean, it's, my mom has this funny story that when I was four years old, I came running around the house where we live with an STP mustache that I got into STP oil treatment. So she says it's kind of like I'm fueled by automotive stuff, you know, because I've started out drinking petroleum right off the bat. Well, what got me started in photography, actually, um, my mom was a hobbyist photographer, photographer when I was a kid and loved photography. And I always had a little point and shoot cameras, you know, from the time I was like six or seven on up. Never been to school for it or anything. I've just always just had my own style and uh, just kind of developed it over the years. You know, I never stopped trying to learn photography, just going to seminars, trying new things. Uh, with as cheap as media is now, you can always just, uh, you know, put another memory card in. There's no reason why not to take photos. And it's such a great hobby for anybody that's into automotive or into anything, is just take pictures. It's, it's, it's pretty fun. A lot of us automotive photographers get looked down on by because the big fancy thing is wedding photographers and portrait photographers and baby photographers. And, um, you know, but I always tell them, it's like, well, when was the last time when you shot a model or a bride, you had to worry about seeing your own reflection in the side of a bride. So, you know, light's way more critical. It's harder to light a subject than, you know, just one person standing there. And uh, not knocking portrait photographers, you know, in reversing the thing, but it's just, you know, people should actually try it once before they start going, oh, you just shoot cars for a living, because I get a lot of that. Just when you think, you know, you should be jaded and you've seen everything, somebody builds something new and really cool. Um, if you see in the video all the signatures on the van, it's just, you know, every time I shoot somebody's car, I get them to sign the van and you look back at it and you think, wow, that was awesome, that was awesome, that was awesome. And it's like, you can't just nail it down to one. And, you know, it's never been, I got to meet so-and-so, this big famous builder. It's, you know, to me, all those guys are even and, you know, they just, I mean, build just some awesome rides and so there's really not any one moment that I could put ahead of anything else. What I do, you don't really retire from this. I don't, I don't see myself ever retiring from taking pictures and shooting hot rods and going out and meeting people and doing what I do. I mean, it's um, when I'm 80, I plan on still doing the same thing I'm doing now and probably I'll probably die with a camera in my hand.
Well, it's a 1963 XL Ford Falcon Squire. It's a, um, it's basically a standard Falcon wagon underneath all the fiberglass trim, which is a carryover from the American model. So they, um, they have a long tradition of building cars actually out of wood back in the day. And that sort of wound up around 1953 when they replaced wood with fiberglass, which this is here. Um, I was at a mate's shop one day. He had a lowrider bicycle sh store on Brunswick Street in Fitzroy. And I was building a few bikes at the time. And I had an early Falcon, a 60 model was my daily. And I had that parked out the front. And I was just chatting with Paulie there. And the guy said, oh, is that your early Falcon out the front? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we got chatting. He's like, yeah, mate of mine. He's got a yard full of them, heaps of shit. He's trying to sell them. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, tell me more. And so we got chatting and he said, oh, you know, there's this, this, this. And I was like, yeah, you know, seen them all. And then he said, oh, an Esquire. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I've only really seen them in pictures, you know, I never come across a real one. So I said, give me his number. And I got a number off him, rang him up the next day. And he was, he was like, yeah, yeah, there's a Squire here. Yeah, I want to sell it. And I, first I had to ask what the price was, because I know a lot of people think they're, a, you know, unobtainable price. And he was like, oh, about two and a half grand. I'm like, yeah, that's in, my, that's in my price bracket. So I went out and had a look at it and just grabbed it right there. <laughs> and so I drove it on the trailer and I knew that from picking it up, that my whole ambition was just to restore it. It was never going to be used as is. So as soon as I got off the truck, it was just start stripping it down. Drive's good, I mean I've got cross by tyres which are sort of pretty outdated and you know squirm on the road a bit but you know they're good, I don't mind it like that. Could do with more power, it's only a measly 200 cubes so that would be my main, <laughs> main problem with it but yeah. In the future of, uh, of hot rodding and, and just driving classic cars you know it's just in some regards looks looks pretty grim, but I don't know, I'm sure we'll find a way, you know. And it's a passion, you always sort of keep following it, even if that's the way the, even if it goes against what the rest of the society wants, but I'm not, not really um, going to be convinced that driving electric cars is the way of the future. I'll always be tinkering with these, I reckon. I kind of just see it as part of the family now, and probably don't need to sell it unless you know, times got tough, but otherwise I'd just hang on to it, pass it on to my son. Yep.
poetry in motion, you know, this thing is uh, way ahead of its time. It's gorgeous lines. It's, when you wash the car, it's, it's almost uh, sensuous, just, you know, the curvatures in this thing. I and mean, they're just gorgeous, whether you're washing the car, it's a joy just to wash the darn car, you know, or seeing it drive by. It's just, you got these timeless, sensuous lines. Getting gas in this thing is a real chore because it takes an hour to get in and out of a gas station because all of a sudden you've got 20 people around. How fast does it go? What year is this? Uh, how long have you had it? All the questions, you know. I built a model of this car when I was probably 10 years old. It just kind of grabbed me then. It's one of those little dollar plastic models and um, painted in silver. I thought, this is a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous car. Someday, you know, I'm going to have one of these things. Everybody should be able to set a goal as a 10-year-old child and fulfill it. There was no miracle in my story. Um, I think uh, it shows that anybody can do anything if you start early enough and keep that dream alive, you know. It took me 30 years to get to the point to get it, but here it is. So anybody that wants one, keep the dream alive. Most of the cars do not get driven to uh, to convention. If somebody pulls up in one of these, which is usually, you know, my wife and I, and we're the crazy Californians that, that drive the car, you know, through uh, through storms, and uh, you know, it's nothing to hop in it and drive from here to Vail. There's always a storm or two along the way, so sometimes a little road chip, or cracked windshield, or uh, you know, there's always some minor damage that happens. And most of the cars get winched out of a big semi, pushed up into the, into the display area, you know, and with gloves, and then they get pushed back into the semi, and sometimes they'll attempt to start them to move them 20 feet, and they'll sputter, and it's just it's so, so sad. And this thing starts right up and uh, runs right up on the ramp, as proud as can be. When you drive the car to a conference, you know, you probably devalue it, you know, a small amount every time you make a cross-country run, but, uh, Who's, uh, who's counting, I guess. Yeah, it gets driven often, it's driven hard. This car truly runs, we could get in it and go to New York right now in it and, and have no problem uh, going nonstop. It's a way to keep them running, you know, keep them on the road. It'd be a shame not to drive it. If I get too old and I can't get in it, so I, I guess it'll be time to, uh, to let it uh, pass to another guardian, you know, because it'd be a shame to tie this, the car like this down.
a lot of people say I have an attitude. You know, you see me wearing a bandana, you see me, you see me wearing a bandana 24 seven. That's just me. I go to church in, in, in a bandana. So a lot of people know me for the guy with the attitude. So I need to drive something with an attitude. I make sure that all the cars that I build have that specific attitude to them. If they don't have that attitude, they, they weren't built by me. My name is Jesse Castillo. The name of my business is Lords of Customs. My workshop uh, specializes in building custom cars. We do a lot of chops, uh, custom modifications to bodies and uh, suspensions and frames. The business has been around for approximately 12 years since we opened up the actual business, but I've been doing it since I was a kid, since maybe 12 years old. When I was 12 years old, I started building custom bikes. Uh, as a kid growing up in South LA, I, uh, my parents didn't have enough money to buy me a bike. So I built my own bike out of spare parts that I would find around in the, in the alleys and railroad tracks and built my own bike. Uh, went on to start building bikes for other kids in the neighborhood and started making money off of it. And from two wheels, it converted into four wheels. So here I am today. That still stuck to me to this day. Uh, now it's something that I learned to do with the cars I built now. You know, uh, these cars are not something that you can just find in anybody's backyard. It's something that you gotta find. You know, the parts are so hard to find nowadays that you gotta sit there and put a 50 grill, 50 Mercury grill in a 49 Ford shoebox, you know, to make it look good. Because if you can't find the original grill, then you're stuck with a car that nobody wants. Baby Blue, I've been working on this project for roughly a year and a half now. Um, it's a uh, project that I picked up roughly about a year and a half up north. Pretty much it's a rolling body. Brought it in and uh, tore it apart, what was left of it, and brought it back to life. You know, we. Uh, uh, chopped it, we changed the frame, we airbagged it, uh, complete modern suspension on it, complete mo up upgraded engine and transmission. Um, and obviously the, you know, the, the body lines, make, make sure all the body lines flow uh, with your chop. Baby Blue was uh, a rust bucket, you could, call it, you could say when we first picked it up. Pretty much had no floors. If you ever watched Flintstones, it's pretty much what the car looked like. Uh, you know, no, no floors, no, no brakes, no, no engine. Um, and, uh, you know, we picked it up and uh, brought it back to life. The color is a combination of, a, 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 um, of one of the, my very first builds that I built with a 51 convertible that I built a while back. Um, and the color that's on baby blue is pretty much the same color that I made for my convertible uh, years back. And I've, ever since I sold uh, my convertible, I've always wanted to redo something in that, 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 that kind of resembled that vehicle. So that's where the, the color came from, the color combination came from, uh, from my, uh, my convertible. We never have doubts on these vehicles. If you have a doubt, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be in this business. The whole goal is, is uh, I like, I like the challenge. I like taking on challenges. If there's no challenge, then it, get, it, it gets boring. I, I, I don't plan on how I do these builds. I just use my imagination and go with it. Um, a lot of guys will sit there and make uh, a drawing out of the vehicle and how it's gonna look and so forth. The drawings I make, I make them in my head. Uh, and I go from that. Uh, you know, some of my help them to tell me like, what are we doing? Why are we cutting this? Or why are we cutting that? It already looks good. And I'm like, no, cut it. We're gonna cut it this, we're gonna do it this. And they're like, no, we're well, gonna mess it up. Once we're done, they're like, wow, I didn't think it, it would come out that great. Sometimes when I start a project, I see it in, in a certain, I see a picture of it. Towards the end of the day, that, that picture might change. So I sit there and tear it all apart and start over until where, and, until I'm happy with it. You know, for me, it's my name that's out there. The customers get, uh, also get involved in, in, in the builds. Uh, not, all the time, not all the time we agree on stuff, uh, but like I said before, it's my signature. It might be their car, but it's my signature. Uh, so I need to make sure that 
I'm happy with the build. If I'm not happy with the build, it does not leave my, my shop. Uh, because like once again, it, it, it's part of me. Uh, yes, the, the customer owns it, but it's my kid. You know, and, and I can't have somebody tell me how to raise my kid. The uniqueness of the vehicle is the chop. Not one of my chops I do the same. Every chop I do, I do it slightly different. I don't like doing a chop identical to another one because then it's just re a reproduction. It's not custom no more, you know. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of guys will build you a car just like somebody else's car that's already been built. Now it's not a custom car no more. Now it's a reproduction. You know, if you want reproduction, then go buy a Honda. Once Baby Blue is completed, uh, it, will be, it will be shipped to Spain, Barcelona. Um, we already have a customer lined up for it, uh, and it will be shipped out there um, very soon. Like I said, you know, there's a lot of hours, a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of hours, a lot of pain and sweat that goes into them. So every time we build one, that I build one, a, a certain vehicle, there's a part of me that goes into it. You know, uh, when I build these cars, I, you know, once I build them and I sell them, they take part of me, go with them. You know, so I might never go, I might never make it to Spain or might never make it to Australia, but part of my soul is there.